you know, that's the major difference between, in my opinion, a lot of people who are empathetic and, and socialist versus people who are fascist. There is no um, peaceful ethnic cleansing, okay? That doesn't happen. If you're a fascist, your goal is to ultimately rid everywhere of whatever you declare the outgroup, okay? But under a socialist organization of the economy, it's not supposed to happen. There is no ethnic cleansing in that structure. There is no outgroup that needs to be violently purged. All right, we were going to do uh, the second thought video about what happens to rich people under socialism. With this channel and the deprogram and first thought, consider signing up for Nebula at the link below. We'll do Tommy G after this. Nothing. You want the honest answer? Not much will actually happen to rich people under socialism. They'll genuinely be fine. A socialist president wouldn't make Jeff Bezos eat a hundred billion Amazon boxes until his little tummy explodes. We're not gonna bring out the guillotines and pull up Forbes on our phones. There aren't gonna be free rotten tomato boxes from a local organic farm dropped around town. In a socialist society, a former billionaire or CEO would either stay in their position if their workers think they did a good job, or they'd get voted out. Their salary and earnings would probably be reduced so that the gap between the lowest paid and highest paid employee in any company goes down. If they're sitting on a dozen or so empty properties and new housing isn't enough to satisfy everyone's needs, they may only be allowed to keep two, maybe even three. If they got wealthy doing something despicable, like dumping toxic waste. The point is, having two or three houses, as long as it is personal property, is still technically allowed. You can have a fucking summer home, you know what I mean? The idea that like, the idea that that is impossible or that you can't have that or that there is no way to do that is very different than is very different than the concept of private ownership of property. Private property is property that you own with the express purpose of engaging in capital accumulation off of it. That's the difference. Somewhere, their wealth may be used to fix the things they did wrong. And honestly, that's pretty much it. Nothing will really happen to the rich, as in the actual people. The category of rich will change. But we'll get to that. Anyway, <laughs> first from each according to their wealth to each according to their need. Fuck this three house thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, you got it, man. You got it. We can't even have fucking health care in this country, but you know, you're, you're right. No, actually, we're coming for your toothbrush. Personal house used as a hotel? What? For some reason, a lot of people are worried that socialism means going on a rampage. And the first thing we need to talk about to correct that impression is that most socialists aren't dumb. Every piece of socialist writing that has ever existed is constantly emphasizing that individual wealthy people are not the problem. Socialists in general recognize that almost anyone in Bezos's position would do what he does. Same goes for Zuckerberg, or Musk, or whoever your favorite billionaire is. Exploitation and environmental destruction and doing just about anything for a buck is the name of the game under capitalism. And that's what we take issue with. Not that Jeff specifically is the one doing it. This doesn't stop what these billionaires are doing from being wrong. But most of it is just perfectly legal. And all we'd want to do is change that to put an end to it. Not to punish people. Just make the awful stuff stop. Most of us socialists take issue with the system of power and wealth accumulation that is capitalism, not the individuals who inevitably end up at the top. To put it differently, there are millions of jerks out there that are just as evil as Musk, but who are basically powerless simply because, under this economic system, power can only consolidate in a few people's hands. And I can tell you're skeptical. A lot of people are worried about what socialism might look like after a century of Red Scare rhetoric. It also doesn't help that past socialist revolutions, just like the liberal revolutions that gave us capitalism, have often been bloody affairs. It's normal to be concerned about that when people like me talk about making fundamental social and economic changes. The history of big changes hasn't often been a series of peaceful transitions of power. I think most historians would agree that's never been the case. I will point out, though, that there's a tremendous amount of bloodshed required to keep the current system chugging along. Billions of people are kept in artificial poverty when we have enough food and housing for all. 
Enough jobs that need doing so that no one needs to be unemployed. Enough resources to provide everyone with healthcare and education. Hundreds of thousands of protesters are brutalized by police and army forces when they complain that life is too expensive and the air is getting unbreathable. Not to mention how gruesome wars are constantly waged for the profit of a few defense and oil companies. But even given all that, it's still perfectly normal to be worried about the possibility of additional violence. And that's why I want to make this video. What I want to clear up is the false idea that violence against the wealthy would be a part of regular socialist society, because it simply wouldn't be. The main concern of socialism is equal democratic and economic power. A guaranteed higher standard of living coupled with a more extensive democracy. In this system, essentially, no one should get wealthy enough to exploit someone else and become democratically unaccountable. Businesses compete, the winners monopolize and oligopolize, and basic needs are gatekept while companies are given a license to destroy or appropriate common resources. The ultra-wealthy have an outsized influence in politics and in the workplace, and the entire economy is geared towards maximizing their ability to profit. In some cases, profit and human well-being go together. In most, not so much. Under capitalism, what decides if something happens isn't popular approval, but profitability, which is determined by how much employers exploit their employees, how wealthy or desperate their consumers are, and even how recklessly they can destroy the What are you doing, bro? Are you fucking drunk? What's happening? The environment. The idea is to stop all that by bringing the economy under democratic control. To have workers elect their boss, or choose to restructure their workplace entirely based on their expertise in actually doing the work. To have natural monopolies and other parts of the economy controlled by a democratic government. To have some market mechanisms not guided by profit. To replace private banks with public banks, with appointed or elected representatives. Instead of a board of directors trying to figure out how to make workers pee in more bottles, a democratic council would decide the best way to use something like Amazon's distribution network and algorithms to actually benefit society. The point is, nothing happens to wealthy people under this arrangement. The rich are just not part of the plan. Not the individuals, they can stick around. But the idea of someone getting obscenely wealthy in this society seems pretty pointless, and ideally impossible. As a real-life anecdote, look at how the last emperor of China was treated after their revolution. <laughs> They didn't bro, he's on, the guy. He's on TikTok, brother. What do you mean? He's fucking you know how you know how you know how a man was treated, dude? Let me see. Yeah, that's that's Pui. That's what happened to him. Uh, you know. They gave him a re education, helped him understand why the position of emperor was outdated, and eventually he became a member of China's National People's Congress helping to make progress alongside the very same people he had previously oppressed. He was reintegrated into a better society. In a future socialist system, the rich and powerful themselves would be fine. But most of the privileges and access to power that create billionaire levels of wealth just wouldn't exist. The only way to become incredibly wealthy in a socialist society is to have a unique set of skills, the way an actor or an athlete becomes incredibly wealthy under capitalism. Being basically irreplaceable might command a higher price for your labor. But even then, you'd still end up with a much more equal society. Some inequality might still persist, but at a much different scale and within a much, much smaller range. The difference between capitalism and socialism is that you wouldn't be able to get wealthy by paying workers less than the amount they bring in for your company. You couldn't gain wealth by exploitation, and that's it. You're still skeptical. No problem. Here's another reason you shouldn't be worried about what happens to rich people under socialism. Most socialists are very anti-punishment. Just talk to your lefty friends and you'll see. Most socialists today are at the forefront of the restorative and transformative justice movements, as well as the prison abolition and anti-death penalty movements. The most famous representative of this socialist position is probably someone like Angela Davis, who's campaigned for all of these causes for decades. The idea of punitive justice, or the eye-for-an-eye eye logic that governs a lot of our justice system today, is deeply unpopular in the modern left, and one of the things that socialists are adamantly against. In parallel to socialist ideas about changing systems, we would much rather make crime less economically necessary or less enticing by ensuring everyone's needs are met unconditionally than by threatening people with a violent state apparatus. 
we would much rather strip people of their power over others and institute a more developed democracy that extends to the workplace than allow a few to gain power through exploitation and punish them when they, predictably, use that power to those ends. Socialists promote structural change first and foremost, and are against punitive justice as a way to solve structural issues. The idea that this would just not apply to those who happen to be wealthy is possible, but realistically very unlikely. And of course, this isn't to say that a socialist society would be without the means to punish people who commit crimes. Historically, after every revolution, there have been elements, often funded by one of the capitalist powers, that tried to undermine the socialist project through acts of terror. This wouldn't be acceptable in a socialist society any more than it is in a capitalist one. Those people would still face the consequences of their actions, whatever those consequences are determined to be. But on the whole, the goal of socialist justice is to be it is always funny when capitalists talk about like um, a socialist transition and the uh, inevitable violence and they become the most like ridiculous uh, uh, across the board humanitarian anarchists in that very moment where they're like, well, any kind of transition to power requires violence. Like, what do you mean? Uh, and it's like, okay, so do you think the current system is violent? Like, is, is it violent for the majority? Do you recognize that then? Because it's always the same projection, right? It's the same principle behind uh, white people fearing being the minority in America because they know what they've done to minorities in the past. And what if minorities will enact the same kind of violent retribution against them? Well, what if they don't, you know? I saw this before, uh, I saw this earlier today on Twitter where someone was talking about these fucking ghouls on the right who were, like, talking about how um, the, the guy who wanted people to recycle got fucking violently stabbed in Brooklyn, and they were celebrating it. And then after they were done celebrating it, like, uh, yesterday, they were now talking about how, like, well, they actually... Um, they actually deserve it. Uh, these leftists deserve being uh, punished this way because they hate us in the same exact way. How dare you? And and a comment on that uh, that that stuck with me that I also regularly mention is that yeah, I fucking hate right wingers. Like it's not not a secret that I hate right wingers. It's not a secret that I hate reactionary people. It's not a secret that I fucking hate fascists. But I still want them to have health care. I still want them to have education. I still want them to have uh, a, a comfortable existence, right? I wanted to. I want to make it so that uh, the material conditions are so uh, so well for them that they uh, that that it, it's virtually impossible for them to still uh, maintain a position that they are like violent reactionaries. Will they still exist under a similar situation? Certainly, but. If everything is uh, if everything is set up, then most people will already outcast them as social pariahs in general. Obviously, there will still be an enforcement mechanism, but you know that's the major difference between, in my opinion, a lot of people who are empathetic and and socialist versus people who are fascist. There is no um, peaceful ethnic cleansing. Okay. That doesn't happen. If you're a fascist, your goal is to ultimately rid everywhere of whatever you declare the outgroup. Okay? But under a socialist organization of the economy, it's not supposed to happen. There is no ethnic cleansing in that structure. There is no outgroup that needs to be violently purged. Don't forget that going back to being a worker is a fate worse than death for some. Yeah. The point is, there is no outgroup in that structure. <sighs> there is no outgroup in that structure, and, and their violence does not need to happen in that situation at all. It does not. Violence, however, is oftentimes a historic constant. But I won't stop pushing for an ideal transition. You know what I mean? How do you tackle the argument that we are idealists? What do you mean? You need idealists. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, oh, it doesn't work in practice type shit? If people claim that it doesn't work in practice, then they're just objectively wrong. 
I think that capitalism was useful historically, and it has outlived its usefulness. But those who uh, brought about these changes, who at least sit at the top of the structure, refuse to let go. Capitalism is a system that necessitates violence for its own maintenance. There is no way that this structure holds together this unjustifiable structure where the majority serve the interests of the few, the tiny minuscule minority, um, without a constant flow of violence. It is inherently less violent to evolve out of this economic organization to a better one. Million dollar mansion. They want you dead, cuck behavior. You wish the out group is the group that wants you out. Sorry, sorry. fake socialist, million dollar mansion. Yes, I am a fake socialist. Okay, I am. I'm a capitalist. I love capitalism. Okay, does that, does that make you happy? Now listen to my words as a capitalist then, okay? I'm a very successful capitalist, right? Think about that. If that's the case, you should respect me, right? You should respect my authority. You should respect me. You should respect the, the incredible industrious nature of myself, a beacon of prosperity that you want to be like. If that's the case, and yes, by the way, it's a $3 million mansion. Fucking get it right, piece of shit. Okay? If bigger the number, better the person. If, richer, if, uh, if uh, a richer person is actually uh, you know, better than a poorer person, then why don't you fucking listen to me then? Be more restorative than punitive as we saw with the example of the Chinese emperor. I get that all this conflicts with the popular ideas most people have about socialism, but let's be clear. Don't mistake eat the rich sweaters for a policy proposal. With so much violence committed by capitalists and their institutions against the working class and the environment, it's understandable that anger will bubble up and find its expression in edgy slogans. But as far as solutions to capitalism's violence go, eat the rich isn't one of them. Eating the rich without changing the system that reproduces unaccountable billionaires isn't progress. It's just a funny quote. And just in case some of you try to misrepresent what I'm saying, none of this is to say that disruptive protests are illegitimate or anything. Civility and nonviolent protests are a sacrifice protesters make. To go in front of armed police forces and refuse to punch back. No one should demand from those who are oppressed that they should continue being oppressed to stay legitimate and valid. This video isn't some kind of condemnation of all violence or an appeal to complacency. I'm simply clearing up the false idea that daily socialist operation depends on punishing the rich like many pundits seem to imply. What a the cringe, idea you have in What a cringe slogan. I sure hope my favorite political commentator didn't wear a shirt with it. I'll have you know that I did not wear a shirt that says eat the rich on it. It's a shirt that said, make the rich pay. But it's a Berenstein's Bears moment that every single person just automatically went, oh, that's a, that's a eat the rich shirt. We're going to eat the rich shirt, which is fine. I mean, Sean Fain wore a fucking eat the rich shirt today. Uh, is second thought, dude, assuming that the capitals would quietly and peacefully step down in a socialist uprising without a fight? I'm not quite grasping the angle he's coming from here. The angle that he's coming from here is that he's not talking to his fucking reading group in the Marxist-Leninist uh, CPUSA uh, coalition, okay? He's talking to a broader audience, some full of liberals, okay? People who immediately cringe at the first sign of communism or socialism. So, of course, what he's saying is not wrong. It is fundamentally true that there needs to never be any violence whatsoever and a peaceful transition into a socialist uh, socialist organization of the economy is the goal, is the ideal. And we should not stray away from said ideals. That is part of the reason why uh, whenever people ask me what kind of socialist I am, I uh, either don't really mention it or I just say I'm a democratic socialist. Because and, and the things that I advocate for here in the United States of America are specifically about at the at, in the interim period, building a coalition of uh, or building labor power, building working class uh, power, and building coalitions specifically so that we can even make marginal and and totally necessary social democratic reforms. It doesn't stop there, of course, but you have to advocate for things 
You have to advocate for things that are at least like possible in the interim period. And even that period is not a peaceful transition. Let's be fucking real. In your mind that socialists just want to bonk billionaires to solve the problems of capitalism is simply wrong. It's not. Dude, I'm, I'm, look, look, I, I don't like, I don't like this. I, I just like people that spend all of their time, uh, uh, attacking China are, are incredibly unproductive and simply doing the deed of, uh, America's inevitable, possibly very violent retribution against, uh, any kind of Chinese development. I don't think it'll happen though, because the trade relationships are there and it would be unprofitable for everybody. It's not something that you can make money from. It's just, it, it's very, very, very unproductive. Okay. It is incredibly unproductive to just constantly be like, well, China's really bad. China's really bad. China's really bad. We can't even fix our own fucking backyards. Okay. And then we spend all this time being like, Oh man, China is so bad. It's like, no, they're not. Okay. Chinese development has been incredible over the course of the past couple of decades. You're, when you say China bad, China bad, China bad across the board. Yeah. Are there issues with Chinese governance? Absolutely. Okay. They are not great at, uh, uh, at allowing any kind of dissent to exist, but ultimately Chinese people at the very least are very fond of their own government. Okay much more happy with their own government than we are with ours. Despite the fact that they don't actually have uh, uh, that all too much say in what goes on in Chinese development. But they're happy because they see the economic development all around them. I'm a firm believer that Americans would be much happier with their own country and their own governance, even if we clawed back even more of the fucking, um, even if we clawed back more of our civil liberties in the United States of America, but at least, uh, at least offered more amenities to the people that tangible amenities that they could see, that would not be the right thing to do. Okay. Their development is all collapsing. Yeah, dude. Any, any moment now it's going to happen. Any moment now it will collapse. Let him, let him collapse. Let them. You're here. You're in America. You're living in the Western world. Please. What? Lamau, finally a nuanced take, Hasi. If you think that I haven't regularly talked about, uh, regularly with incredible frequency, talked about why I choose to live here and not in China, I don't know what to tell you. Perhaps you think that my position is not nuanced because you have only heard my position through a filter. A filter that is inherently biased. A filter that has an interest in telling you that I do not have a nuanced take in this situation. The point is... Is just that a school-ass take? The point is... Okay? Let fucking China collapse if it's inevitable. Okay? I work for a job. I can only go off your tweets. You right? Point to any tweet that I've ever tweeted about China. Have I ever tweeted about China? Or did you see clip chimps on Twitter of my China takes, which is exactly what I was saying? No. The issue is you want everything spoon-fed to you, and sometimes you are at the whims of others who filter that information before it reaches you. You can exercise critical thinking, especially if you have enough goodwill and enough charitability for being here for as long as you have. The problem here isn't that you're like, I don't know, bravely defending uh, uh, people that have been wronged by China. That might make you feel like your cause is just or anything. The problem here is that you come in here with a cynical attitude, with an assumption that you've made about my position. Okay? Anyway. Ultimately, every single state has its own issues. Every single development process is going to run into hurdles. I have never hid the reality that there is a lot of state suppression of any kind of dissent in China. It is my major criticism with China in general. 
I mean, I saw most of your interview with what's his nuts, the Teddy Fresh guy. No, you didn't. You saw someone else watch that interview. That's why you have this perspective. Anyway, whatever. Dude, I'm shit posting. Just ban me and move on. Yeah, you're brave. You're a brave poster, chatter. Sans tanky arc is upsetting. China bad. China is the enemy to the left. Chinese leftists are criminalized. Hassan's tanky arc is upsetting. See, this is it. People don't want nuance. They want comfortable narratives. Tanky, move on. Got it. Yes, I'm a tanky. Okay. Anyway. The point is... The point is... Holy shit, that was an unironic IRL China bad. You did this, you gave in to one debate perv. I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. There are varying degrees of freedoms. This is very important. This is not just about China, okay? This is about freedom in America. If you are a socialist or you are a leftist, if you're a social democrat even, you understand the principle behind how can you say you're free when you are locked into your job and the system demands that you are locked into your job and you have no freedom because you have no control over your own life in a place where you spend 80% of your adult life in, okay, where your health insurance is tied to your performance, you also cannot move away because you have debts to pay because you are in one of the few nations where you have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and debt and get take on student loan debt specifically so you can get that education and become a more productive member of the working class that is not freedom that's not freedom at all and i think americans regardless of their foreign policy opinions okay understand that reality there are different mechanisms of control under the in my opinion more successful mechanism of social control and instilling social cohesion in the liberal democracies in the west you have options you feel like you have different choices that you can make feel like you can vote for one or the other party and there's actually very serious different consequences for either and yet neither of those parties are actually making genuine material improvements in your life neither of those parties are actually pushing for socialized medicine neither of those parties are actually pushing for free health care and, and a college education neither of those parties are actually opening up avenues so that uh, labor unions can continue to thrive and have some semblance of labor militancy in this country to claw back benefits that are afforded to other workers all around the world in comparable OECD nations. We're in a constant defensive position in a holding pattern as this failed capitalist state gets worse and worse. That is not freedom. It is simply a mirage, a facade of freedom that you have bought into. The inverse of that, in my opinion, is less preferable. An authoritarian system where you may feel like the government has your best interest at heart, or you may not feel like the government has your best interest at heart. You still have no say in what the government does. And then also on top of that, you can't even fucking at least feel like you can dissent. Let's continue. A solution. Ending a system that produces billionaires is the number one goal, not hurting people. We don't want jerks with the authority to change our understanding of what qualifies as a toilet. The problem is the system, not the jerks. Let's be even clearer. For someone uber wealthy under capitalism, life under socialism would be different. An end to exploitation and permanently rising inequality would certainly mean fewer privileges possibly or even probably a less important status, certainly less power to boss people around, and most likely less ability to enjoy excessive luxury at will. But that's probably it. Less power, less privilege, but a life that continues to be more than comfortable as the standards for all of society are raised. Accountability not to boards of directors, shareholders, and the market, but to a democratic workers' association, 
and perhaps most importantly, the opportunity to be a part of a new project that actually improves the conditions of our species. The thing all these billionaires claim to want to do. Under socialism, they could use that drive, if it's genuine, to really contribute. Socialism is the way forward, even if you're a billionaire. Howdy friends! I'm excited to announce that I'm recording this sponsor read from the brand new Second Thought office. That sounds a little fancier than it really is, but I did recently move the whole studio setup to a larger space, and I've got a bunch of cool stuff planned for the near future. Some of the projects yeah. I have in mind, and even being able to move into a new place like this, is only possible thanks to the support of viewers like you. One of the ways you can show that support is by signing up for Nebula. I'm People say they can't protest in China, but they don't realize that the white paper protests literally made the government change their position on lockdowns? Yeah. Second thought is great. The program is, is great in general. Love those boys. Uh, love Hakim. Love you, Gopnik. You know, they're, they're awesome. They're fucking great. I'm sure you're all aware they're doing of Nebula the damn by thing. Now. It's the creator-owned streaming platform that's home to content from all your favorite creators, where we can make the content we really want to make. To give you an idea of one of the projects I have in mind, the three of us at the D program are... I am very... I'm going to reach out to Skara who is the foremost authority on, on uh, VTubers and get and forcibly make Hakim a, a VTube avatar. I think I'm just going to pay for it and I'm going to give it to him and I'm going to be like, you can use it if you want. If you don't want to use it, you don't have to. I've made up my mind. <laughs> 